in order to track you between websites without actually writing to the cookie store. The flash right. cache. <laughs> That's yeah, the flash cache. massively illegal. Uh, ain't where it, ain't said it. I don't know if be, I don't know if I don't know if the legality be on the ethical front. That's definitely unethical. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it might be legal because. Um... Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> okay, welcome back, guys. Welcome back. <coughs> Okay, so it's time, it's time for me to, to talk a bit. Um, I'm going to introduce some, some additional topics today. Um, this one's called Logic for Language. So um, I'm going to con continue our discussion of, um, of, of the history of some of these things. Um, we did some of the history of logic um, last week. I want to go through the history more on the computational side. Um, and then we'll talk about where this has all ended up in modern logic and in um, applications in uh, modern computation, the practical applications of all of this in, in computer science. Um, and then hopefully if we have time, I'm, I'm going to in introduce um, some basic lambda calculus um, and leave, leave you with some lambda calculus um, related tasks either to do here or to um, to take home with you. If we don't have time to do group work today, please feel free to call each other and work together in groups anyway, um, if you have to take this stuff home. To do. So, um, yeah, last week we had the history of logic. Let's do the history of computation. Now, this is different from the history of computers, as we've seen in computer architecture, but with, with some overlap when these ideas start to come together. So, um, last week we got up to Frege. Let's all learn how to pronounce Frege because nobody can. It's Frege. It's not Frege or Frege or Frege. It's Frege. Okay. Everyone say Frege. It's the <laughs> Frege. 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 Okay. I'm definitely calling him Fragman. And there's nothing you can do about it. Okay. You, you, you you <laughs> The other one that's fun is going to be Gerdel, which is an unpronounceable German symbol with the two dots written on top of the O, and it's something like a long... It's, it's yeah, Gerdel. But it's like a good, I mean, I mean it, it could be worse. Really? You've got to you've got to get your best German on and re really make a, a Gerdel. Gerdel. Nice. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> anyway last, last week we got up to Frege in the, the history of knowledge, and we were pushing up to about 1900. So by the time we get to 1900, um, the mathematician David Hilbert um, very famously set down a, a collection of problems called Hilbert's problem. And this, this was to do with it being the year 1900. So I think in, in the year 2000, we did something similar. We, we made a list of about 10 big challenges in mathematics for um, for the new century to solve. So Hil Hilbert was very consciously trying to write down what are the big questions for the, the 20th century um, to solve. And this was all part of what we now know as the modernist movement. Okay, when, when we talk about modernism in any subject, we refer to a particular intellectual climate of this time and heavily centered on Vienna, which was the intellectual center of the world at that time. Everyone would go there to, um, to do their graduate studies for the 1900 equivalent of graduate studies. Um, and there were people in Vienna, known as the Vienna Circle, who shared this idea across all academic disciplines of how, how things should be in the new century. And this, this was called the Modernist Project, you know, in art and architecture and music the modern art, modern music, um, which is distinct from the art and music we have now. Okay, those things are called contemporary art that we have now. And modern art, modern music are from 100 years ago in this period. So the big idea of the modernist project was to put all of human knowledge on very secure foundations. 
um, and to build systems and structures um, and then to be very logical and axiomatic and rule-based about everything else. So for example, in, in music, there were these ideas to create things like the 12-tone system where you're going to define a new set of axioms for creating music um, and then apply the rules um, and see what comes out. Um, most people think it, it didn't work out so well, but they, they tried. Yeah, and similarly, modern architecture was about creating shapes based on very geometric patterns and axioms and rules and tr trying to create a new grammar um, for architecture. So what Hilbert was doing here was the equivalent of that for mathematics. So we touched on this a little bit when we discussed how you were ultimately able to prove that MU was not a theorem. Okay, you ended up having to invoke this other thing called mathematics, which involves natural numbers and addition and primes and multiplication. And, you know, if you've been taught that in school, you are conditioned to believing that it's just true. And, you know, maybe God put it there, or maybe it exists somehow in the universe, whatever, but it's the, the absolute be all and, and end all. And there were questions beginning to arise in mathematics about whether that is really the case. And the worry of the time was that something might show up in mathematics, which would create a contradiction, um, which would then destroy everything. Because in mathematics, if you can find just one contradiction anywhere, you can then go on to prove anything. Yeah? You can prove two equals three, and the, the whole system will just come crashing down. So. You know, along with everyone else in the, the modernist movement, Hilbert was concerned to create a solid set of foundations and, if necessary, to, to make them up um, as long as they could be shown to be solid. Um, you know, as with music and architecture, they could be counterintuitive as, as long as they were new and modern and solid and worked. Um, and Hilbert gave several problems um, of which two of them are concerning us. So the first one is, can we construct all of mathematics out of logic? Okay, can we reduce the academic subject of maths into the other academic subject of logic? So we, we were touching on this before the break, right? We touched on, could you actually create mathematics out of something like the MIU system? Could you come up with a set of axioms and a set of rules that would allow you to model or reproduce or otherwise capture, depending on your point of view, all of the mathematical knowledge that humanity had accumulated up until that point? So, you know, this, this would include mathematics about spaces and sizes and um, geometry and mathematics about numbers, natural numbers and real numbers. Um, and all the other kind of abstract um, structures that, that mathematicians study. So that, that, that's a huge project. But you know, in, in the first case, can you at least reduce numbers or, or, or even just natural numbers? Can you reduce natural numbers down to a logical form and state exactly what the axioms and the rules are? And if everyone could agree on them, um, then you know, why you might agree on a set of axioms is a, an interesting question. But if everyone could agree on a single set of axioms, then everyone could get along and do mathematics and they'd be able to look at each other's proofs and determine whether they were correct or not. Um, and that, that would make mathematics into a very nice, objective, true system. So the, the, the challenge was, is this actually possible or will you, will you find a contradiction in your mathematics, or you find a way of proving that 2 equals 3, which would take the system down. And to avoid that, you need to show that whatever system you're proposing actually works and is free from these contradictions. So this introduced the, the kind of meta-logical thinking that you have just experienced with the MU problem. Okay, ma mathematics is a system, or it's it's supposed to be a system, which someone is going to propose, um, like the MU system. And then you're going to take that system 
And as you did with the MU problem, you're going to think outside of it. You're going to analyze it. You're going to make proofs about the system using your own logic um, and try to prove that certain things are impossible, such as creating a contradiction. So, you know, before the break, we just about proved that MU is not a theorem um, of the MIU system. Can you do that for mathematics? Can you take whatever axioms are being proposed and create your own proof that they're not going to lead um, to these horrible contradictions, which would break everything? So how are you going to make such a proof? What tools are you going to use? Um, you've kicked the problem back to another system. And so Hilbert phrased this as a question, can you use mathematics itself to to verify its own existence. It, mathematics is supposed to be able to do anything, and proving the consistency of mathematics is, is one of those tasks. So the, the way that Hilbert phrased this then is, can you create a system which can model at least arithmetic in terms of logic, um, and which is also able to prove that nothing bad is going to happen using its own logic? So the second question asked here then is, if you have such a system, can you create an algorithm which will automate mathematics? You know, we would like to create a function where you give it a string, and the string is a mathematical question, a candidate theorem such as this one. Um, you're going to input your string and you're going to say, as we did with the MU system, is this a theorem of the system? And if so, give me back the proof. You know, give me the, the program, the set of steps, the rules that you've applied um, that will generate this string from the axioms. Okay. Um, and you know, some of these proofs can be very long. Right? If, if anyone recognizes this, this, this is a little tiny theorem that was proved by a guy from my Cambridge College called Andrew Wiles. Um, and the proof of this has taken several hundred years of cumulative effort. And I don't know if it's ever even been printed out. It would fill many volumes of, of books. And even, I believe even now we're not completely certain that it actually works. And a lot of the logical tools that we're discussing in these classes are now being used to try to prove that the proof actually works, okay? So there are people running things that are the equivalent of Matthew's program for checking theorems and checking proofs. And there's this huge effort to verify that the proof of this thing actually works. But it's tiny, right? It's a tiny string of ASCII characters that is gonna give rise to all that work, just as you found with the new system. Gary spent six hours producing theorems, trying to make MU, and it's it's just the same when you try and make theorems about numbers like this. So two two questions then, right? Can we construct all of mathematics out of logic in such a way that it's able to validate its own existence and be the one true mathematics? And second, can you create an algorithm which can automate mathematics? <coughs> so very quickly, there were responses to, to Hilbert's program. Hilbert was a, a very famous, influential figure of the time. He gave a big speech about it to mark the new century, and it, everyone sprung into action um, trying to find solutions to his problem. Um, so Frege came back in, and we now know how to pronounce him, right? Frege, Frege, Frege. Um, so Frege spent several years of his life um, creating a solution based on set theory um, and writing a huge book about it, um, which claimed to give a logical basis, um, at least for these arithmetic, um, arithmetic parts of mathematics. Um, and very famously, he was just about to go to press with his great big book that he'd been slaving over for all this time when he received a letter from uh, one Bertrand Russell um, in England pointing out a, a flaw in his system. Um, and this, this was one of the great examples in science of someone's work just being utterly 
destroyed in a, a single letter. You know, you spent two years writing this giant book and you get a little note from Bertrand Russell saying, hey, have, have you thought about this little problem? Um, and you know, the, the nature of this system building is you only have to find one paradox or contradiction and it, it really does blow up the entire system, um, re rendering it useless. And this was to do with the barber, okay? So imagine a small village. Um, oh, and we're all, um, we're all gen gender neutral nowadays, so ev everyone in the village shaves, okay? Um, if you're a man, you can shave your beard. If you're a woman, you can shave your legs. And if you're any other gender, then you can pick whatever you like. But everyone is going to shave. Okay, and I'm going to give you that as an axiomatic fact. Okay, um, so the next thing I'm going to tell you is that some people shave themselves, and anyone who doesn't shave themselves goes to the barber. Okay, so the barber shaves everyone who does not shave themselves. Got it? So the question is. Who shaves the barber? He's a hairy boy. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, well, uh, the Schrodinger's barber. <laughs> does he or does he not have hair? <laughs> Uh, well, axiomatically, he has hair and he shaves it. Um, so I, I, yeah, there, there's no barber because he can't shave himself because he can't shave anyone who doesn't shave themselves. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it's just poorly yeah, formed. So that that's a that's a an, an, yeah poorly formed. It's an illogical set. It doesn't. Yeah. Okay. So look, Frege's theory of sets was all based on this idea that you could specify a set via a sense. You, you could consider the set of all people who do not shave themselves. And that that would have been part of the construction um, that Frege's set theory um, was able to put together. And so this, this is what Bertrand Russell wrote in his letter to, to Frege. He gave the mathematical equivalent of the set of people who do not shave themselves um, in this village. Um, I, I now just, I just feel sorry for Frank look, looking at the dates on there. Like, this person creates, creates this whole theory, publishes it, and less than a year later, someone comes along and just obliterates it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, so he, all he, that hard work has just gone straight down the drain. So he, was, he was literally just about to send the book to press. So they, they didn't have LaTeX in those days. You know, typesetting a book really meant typesetting it with you know little metal bits of characters. The, the whole thing about to go out when, when this, this famous letter arrived. Um, so, so Russell himself with his colleague uh, Whitehead then made an attempt to fix it. They they made an attempt to create their own um, axiomization of mathematics based from logic. And in doing so, they invented uh, what is now called type theory. And this relates to the types that you have in your programming languages. You know, the types of strings and numbers and the types of functions from integer to integer and, and so on. Um, so by defining a hierarchy of logical types, they were able to avoid um, the barber paradox because they, they banned that notion of a set. You, you, can, only, you can only define the members of a, a class, and they call them classes rather than sets, um, in terms of things that already have a, a good definition. So the, the set of people who don't shave themselves has some component of circularity. If you, you first have to define what it means to shave yourself and who those people are before you can group them into a set. Um, and so this was a huge undertaking. This is another legendary, um, I think it's a set of books. So there are about three volumes of this. So this this was called the Principia, or the, the Principles of Mathematics. And they, yeah, they, they spend most of three volumes building up arithmetic 
from logic. And by the end of it, you can prove that one plus one equals two using a set of axioms and rules similar to the, the new system. Um, so this, this wasn't the only solution. It, it turns out that there are many ways of setting up bases for mathematics. Logic is only one. The logic was the original intention of Hilbert's problem. Other people have gone back to set theory and set it up in different ways. So most mathematicians nowadays will use an axiom set called ZFC from 1922 um, to build their mathematics on. Uh, it's not the only one. There's things like Quine's New Foundations from 1937 um, is popular, at least in this kind of logic-based community. Um, and various other systems continue to be proposed today. So, if, for example, category theory has recently become very popular um, as a basis of mathematics as well as the basis of computer science. But we're, we're primarily interested in the, the logical version of this story since we're studying logic and computation. Um, so for a while, this seemed to be the solution to all, all our problems then. He was Russell and Whitehead's system of mathematics reduced to logic um, and not falling prey to um, Russell's own barber paradox. And then in 1931, um, a bomb went off. This, this was Kurt Gödel. And let's all say Gödel again. G Gödel. Does anyone here speak German? Gödel. Good. 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 It's like it's like strudel but with an O. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's how you pronounce the funny little dots on the uh, like good, good, good. Umlaut. It's an umlaut. Umlaut. Yeah, yeah. It's like yes. it's like in the pe heavy metal bands, isn't it? Is it not, yeah. Not <laughs> I think it's more yeah. to do with the fact that they're from that area than that they're heavy metal bands. And the correlation is that lots of heavy metal bands are from rounds there, rather than it's a fashion thing. So the, the Motley Crue should really be called the, the Moogie Crew. The Moogie, Moogie Crew. Crew. That Moogie is what Moogie. I have always called them. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh, my I'm, I'm just sad that no interviewer has ever... And here we have the Moogie Crew. <laughs> okay, so... I don't, a lot of English people will, will just read this as, as Godel nowadays. So, uh, you know, on, on the internet, I've noticed more people trying to pronounce it in the German way just recently. So take take your pick. I, I don't really mind if you say Godel. I, I, I mind if you say Freig, because um, Freiger is definitely Freiger. But Godel, try and say it if you can. But Godel is acceptable to English people, I think. So this, this is the most celebrated intellectual bombshell of all time, right? This marks the end of modernism and the start of postmodernism across all intellectual fields. And it started here in logic and mathematics. Um, because up till this point, we had this idea that mathematics or any intellectual system could have a set of coherent axiomatic foundations. It could be well-defined. Um, and it should be able to prove its own consistency um, and its own completeness. It should be able to prove using its own rules that it works. And you know, this is this is an absolutely fundamental belief, even today, of many mathematicians. Because if you don't have this, then mathematics is just a human invented culturally relative constructs, because I could create a set of axioms and say, I think this is what mathematics should be. And you could create a different set of axioms which can produce different theorems. And you could say, this is what I think mathematics should be. So, you know, I, I might think that all of professional mathematics should be based on the MIU system. And, you know, I'm going to go off and apply for the funding bids to go and discover new theorems in the MIU system. And you might want to go off and use a different system, like the PQ system, and, and be funded to do that. Um, and you know, as you saw in the MIU system, you ultimately had to appeal to a higher authority. You had to appeal to arithmetic to be able to make your meta theorems. So if mathematics is actually going to be objective, 
you know, existing in the world independently of human constructs of it, um, then there can't be any higher authority that you go around appealing to when you want to prove whether it works or not. It must be self-hosting effectively. Um, and if it isn't self-hosting, then you will always need to call on some higher power that is the real mathematics. And your mathematics was not the real mathematics. So what, what Godel showed in 1931 is that it is impossible to build such a system. You cannot build a self-hosting mathematics stack. Um, and any attempt to do so will either lead to a contradiction or it will lead to an omission. It will lead to something existing that is true, but that your system isn't able to prove is true. And again, for many mathematicians, even today, this is just utterly mind bending because your whole concept of mathematical truth, when you think logically, is that something is true if your rules can prove it. Yeah, you would, you would like mathematics to be this system that is very well defined. And if, if there's a way of applying your rules to get from the axioms to the theorem, then the theorem is true and otherwise it isn't. But Godel's theorem tears this apart and it says there are things which are true, but your logic cannot prove no matter what your logic is. So this is still discussed and debated over by many people, even today, exactly what this means. I think Goodell's own reading of this was actually very positive. So Goodell did believe that there was an objective reality of truth, but he just believed that it was forever out of the grasp of any formal system, including human mathematicians. Um, so he, he believed that his theorem shows this. It shows that there are statements which actually are true. They are objectively true in the real physical world, but your mathematics can never prove. And that therefore mathematics is talking about something bigger than itself. It's talking about something which cannot be captured by any attempt to write it down. And you know, people will get excited about Eastern religions and philosophy and consciousness and all, all kinds of crazy concepts um, as they try to understand exactly what this means. Um, and this, in the theorem, it's shown that this applies to any logic uh, which has the ability to represent at least basic arithmetic. So you have to be able to add and you have to be able to multiply. So you don't even need fancy things like um, real numbers or geometry, just basic arithmetic, adding and, and multiplying. Um, and if we if we go fast enough, we'll we'll try and study the details of this proof later in the module. Um, you know, for now, it is roughly based on another paradoxical concept. Yeah, you know, we saw the 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 barber who shaves everyone who doesn't shave himself. Um, so Godel's theorem is based on a logical analog of this sentence. Your, your logic cannot prove this sentence. Okay. Um, so again, just meditate on this for a moment and try and decide whether this sentence is actually true or false. Okay. Where the word your refers to you. <laughs> it's what, whatever logic you personally are using to try and prove this sentence. So would, would anyone like to offer an argument for why the sentence is either true or, or false? Um, my, my logic, uh, what's, what's a good way of, of saying it in the, in the same way as the sentence? Um, well, my logic can prove this is true, which means that my logic can't prove that this sentence is true, which means that my logic, that this sentence is true. So do, you, do you think the sentence is true? Do you, do, do you feel that it's true? Um, well, you could also say the opposite is the problem. Okay. 
So I'm I'm pretty sure, Matthew, that that your logic can't prove this sentence. <laughs> See, I, I I can look at you. I can look at you struggling with the sentence. Uh, and I'm I'm absolutely certain uh, that the sentence is true. Actually, I, I have no doubt whatsoever because I, I can see you struggling, I can see you going into an infinite loop, um, and I, I can explain why that loop is taking place, and that's my proof of why why the sentence is true. Okay, I, no, I, just I, I can wait for explain... a stack to overflow. <laughs> I I can explain why you can't prove the sentence, and I'm very happy that this sentence is in fact true without any question. But when you try to prove it, uh, <laughs> then this happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, so yeah. That, that's, uh... So look, pe so. people have gone crazy over this thing, including Goodell himself, whose life had some very strange episodes indeed. Um, and you know, you you will see this alluded to in much of popular culture now. You know, there are as well as books like Odell Ashibark and The Emperor's New Mind. Any, anyone seen the movie Pi? Okay. No. Pi, Pi is about a mathematician who's found the, the Godel sentence for his own brain, and he's trying to conceive it. And he, he ends up um, drilling a hole in his head with a, a power drill to try and make it go away. Spoilers. Um, <laughs> there, there, there are lot, lots of references um, to this in the, the Matrix, for example, um, at the end, especially in the later Matrix movies, you know, it, it turns out Neo is necessary to complete the Matrix because the, the formal system of the Matrix cannot make a choice. It requires this extra ingredient to fill its missing theorem that it's trying to prove. Um, and, you know, there's there's a lot of fun and often not very mathematically correct speculation about the meaning of all this. You know, Godel's theorem is a, it's a mathematical theorem, or rather it's a meta-mathematical theorem. You know, it only applies to the domain um, which it was intended to apply. It is a formal theorem about formal logic. And you know, many mathematicians and logicians get quite upset by all these other artists and everyone piling in and saying things that are incorrect about their theorem, um, you know, especially when you get to some some of the philosophy. Uh, and go, go to Lesher Bark is especially accused of doing this um, because it does it makes analogies. Go to Lesher Bark is really a book about philosophy of mind, and he's using Godel's theorem purely as an analogy to give you a an idea of what. Hofstadter's theory of mind actually is, but it's often misread as claiming that Godel's theorem is actually giving a mathematical proof of these things in, in philosophy of mind, when it's only making an analogy. And you know, this this has trickled down through everything, all through postmodernism, and the idea that we actually can't write down a fixed set of rules that are true and operate within them. You know, this has ended up in cultural relativism relativism in, in all its forms. You know, I have my beliefs, you have your beliefs, and there's nothing we can do to, to say that any one of them is true. They're just different from one another. Charles, does hmm. it equate to the similar thing of this sentence is false? Uh, roughly, yeah. That's that's a good I was almost going to write that on the slide. So my, my take on it, this, this is a sentence that I've created. Your logic can't prove the sentence. My, my take is that this is a slightly more accurate translation into English of, of what the yeah. theorem actually said. But yeah, a good, a good starting point is this sentence is false. Yeah, or you know, I, think, I think I said to all you guys the very first time I met you, I think I said all lecturers are liars in computer architecture. Lecture one, yep. which is a, a, another famous version of, of the paradox. Okay. It, it was originally said by a Greek who said all, all Greeks are liars. So you know, these, these are analogs, okay? I've said this, it's the logical analog. Go, Godel's theorem is a formal logical theorem and it exists as a piece of mathematics and that is, that's what it is. Now, any attempt to translate it into English or poetry or music is not going to be entirely accurate. And you know, as with 
quantum mechanics, you can get into a lot of trouble by spouting nonsense about it in the pub when you haven't actually done the mathematics. But ho hopefully, if we if we can go fast enough, we'll try and actually at least look through the mathematics to understand what what the Godel sentence actually is. Okay. So that, that was 1931, okay? So it's an interesting year. Why is it an interesting year? Or well, what, what, what's, what's going to be very interesting very shortly after this? Uh, on 1936, you yeah, have a few people that show up. But... Uh, okay. So yeah, computer science history has two dates, 1836 and 1936. So this is five years before 1936. Okay, so yeah, the emphasis with Hilbert and Godel was very much about mathematics. And remember, mathematics is just one application of logic. You know, these these people are only talking about particular logical systems, and they're the logical systems that are capable of representing arithmetic. So Godel's theorem doesn't apply to other logical systems. It doesn't apply to the MIU system. It doesn't apply to a lot of the logics you'll find in artificial intelligence, for example. Um, and you know, a, lot, a lot of the commentators who try and discuss AI with relevance to Godel's theorem should really try and understand that a, a little better. You know, there are the kinds of logics that you use in systems like Prolog are not necessarily going to be caught in the, the Godel net unless they have basic arithmetic um, capabilities built in. <coughs> okay, so look, this. This was a negative answer to the first of the Hilbert problems we have discussed. Um, I'm just going to call them Hilbert's one and two problems. They have, they were really part of a set of, I think, about 10. So they actually have other numbers, but I'm just going to call them one and two because I can never remember which is which other. Um, if Godel gave a negative answer to that first question then is, can, can we create a solid foundations of mathematics that is self-hosting and able to prove um, its own verification. Um, so let's consider the responses to Hilbert's other question then, which is, is there an algorithm to answer any maths problem? You know, can we give it those little strings of arithmetic theorems like Fermat's last theorem? Actually, it's Fermat, isn't it? Okay, let, let's learn to pronounce everyone. Fermat was French, and in French you don't pronounce the last letter, so it's Fermat, although it looks like Fermat. 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 Yeah. Fermat, a French guy. Okay. Um, so we've got Frege and Gödel and Fermat. Right. Um, so can can we create an algorithm, a a, a automatable process to decide whether a theorem is true or not. Now, again, these these people are coming from the mathematical tradition. Okay, when, when they talk about algorithms, this is a different intellectual history from this kind of thing, right? We in architecture we've seen the evolution of abacuses and performing algorithms on clay tablets and going through machines like these. So everyone recognize these machines? Do you remember these? Yes. Which which is which? We've got one of Babbage's engines in the center there. Yeah. Um, to the left, is that the thing that was fell off the Greek boat? And that's yep. a reconstruction of that's it. The, um, and that's the solar. solar. <laughs> yeah. Solar system stuff, and then that's a loom at the end, is it? This this is a I, IBM Horowitz machine from about oh. 1885. Yeah. Okay, good. So, I mean, this this kind of mechanization has been going on for for a long time, but the people who built these machines were generally looked down on by mathematicians, and it was seen as a really as a branch of engineering or something that was so practical that it wasn't really of interest to to mathematicians. Um, so, you know, in, even in the Babylonian system, this is a Babylonian play tablet, and you find um, Babylonian mathematics is interesting to compare with what Gary was just showing us, actually. On, 
On Gary's proofs, you can see there are two columns, and one shows the state of the system at each step, and the other says what rule is being carried out. Um, and you tend to find systems like that in the Babylonian al algorithm. R rather than give the program, rather than give the right-hand column, they just show the state of the system from one step to the next, and the reader is expected to infer from that what the, the algorithm is. So that the algorithm is presented through examples of it running. Um, and that was very natural, um, and it continued into Babbage's work. When you look at um, the instruction set of Babbage's engine is still argued about because the programs are never written down as programs. They're shown using Gary's left column, showing how the states evolve over time. Um, so yeah, everyone had this kind of vague idea of what an algorithm is. You know, there are known algorithms you can run on an abacus for doing pretty complex things, actually for doing pretty much anything, you know, computing square roots and exponentials and trigonometry. And some of those things were known to the Babylonians who could execute them on an abacus. So you know, rough, roughly everyone thought an algorithm is the kind of thing that can be executed on any of these machines. But no one really sat down and defined what the word algorithm should mean mathematically because well, no one really had any reason to um, but they they acquired a reason to do it when Hilbert posed this problem because when Hilbert says does there exist an algorithm that can solve math problems we now need to know exactly what an algorithm is mathematically you're proving the existence or non-existence of of something from a set of algorithms, we need to be very clear about what that set actually is. So yeah, everyone had this intuition that it was you know, roughly anything you could do on one of those machines, um, but it needed to be nailed down and defined um, rigorously. And wonderfully, this happened at the same time that logic had matured. You know, all the work that uh, Frege had done and Boole, um and then all the work going through uh, Russell and ultimately Godel had got people thinking very actively about logic and had developed logic into a, a more powerful tool that now could start to talk about large areas of mathematics. And if you remember, Aristotle's logic is very limited. It can really only deal with sets set of things with properties and some of them have some properties and all men are mortal and so on, but it's not able to model natural numbers, and multiplication and arithmetic. But now, now we have the tools to be able to do that. So yeah, logic had matured to the point where we could now consider it as a basis to define what an algorithm actually is. Um, and once we're able to do that, we can then look at Hilbert's other problem about whether such an algorithm exists um, for this purpose. Um, this this all happened again very, very quickly. Now, arguably, you can count Gödel's own work as a model of computation because, as part of his theorem, he uses a, a purely mathematical notion of of what an algorithm is. Um, roughly, he's doing something a little bit like functional programming where he defines a set of very basic functions and then he defines functions made out of those functions and functions made out of those functions and so Godel can build up mathematics and the notion of an algorithm purely in terms of mathematical functions and natural numbers um, and it turns out that, that that system is sufficient to to capture this notion of an algorithm because remember a computer is a machine that can simulate any other machine and if you can use Godel's maths to simulate any of these other things then they're all just as good as each other um, but it's never really caught on as a model of computation because it it doesn't have a obviously mechanizable form it's more of a conceptual mathematical form whereas when you get to 1936 um, the, the great year of 1936 was when several people proposed 
more mechanizable models of computation, um, all within a few months of each other. And the first of those was Church, who proposed Lambda Calculus, that we're going to look at later. Um, shortly after that, Alan Turing proposed the Turing machine, um, which is a very mechanizable model, and it de generally caught the imagination because it's so close to what you can actually build out of a, a long piece of paper tape and, and physical machinery. Um, but there were others. There's something called a, a post machine, which is like a, a some, somewhat nicer version of a Turing machine, where instead of wrapping around with a infinitely long paper tape, you get an infinite number of boxes that you can just put things in and out of, and you don't have to mess around fast forwarding and rewinding the tape. You can just go straight to the box, which makes everything much much easier to work with. Um, and again, some, somewhat arguably, you know, Sh Shannon proposed his logic gates in 1936, not as a model of computation, um, really just as a way of simplifying the wiring for a telephone company. But we come to understand that this is also as powerful as these these other models um, to, to set up what we mean by computation and by algorithm. Um, but the, the general finding from all of this work was that they are equivalent to each other, because the whole point of the, the computing device is that it can simulate any other one. So if you're in that club, it doesn't really matter um, whether you move around the other models in the club. But the, the point of, apart from Shannon, the, the point of this work was to try and answer Hilbert's question. So Hilbert is saying, is there an algorithm that can do maths automatically? And so all, all these models are here to define what an algorithm is. An algorithm is a, a set of steps that is going to execute on one of these models of computation. <coughs> so of course, now, nowadays, there's a, a geek hobby um, almost of finding other equivalent models of computation, beginning with logical combinators, which are somewhat related to lambda calculus um, but you know now, nowadays you'll find people on the internet show that you can create computation out of Tetra or Minecraft or certain combinations of Lego bricks um, precisely because these things are all equivalent um, to one another but everyone who was interested in this and you know, initially it was church who did this first um, they come to the same conclusion. They find that you cannot make an algorithm or a machine that can solve any maths problem. So they give a negative answer to the second of Hilbert's problems. Um, you, know, you, you cannot replace Andrew Wiles with a black box that you give it ASCII strings in formal logic about mathematics and it spits out yes or no. Um, and the reason for this it's expressed differently in each of these models, but roughly they all come down to the same idea. And again, it's about creating a, a paradox. Ruff, roughly, you're going to create a question that blows up the machine. Okay, if, if someone claims to have created such a machine, you're going to create a mathematical question for it, which it cannot answer. And the, the way you do that is by making it a question about its own behavior. But you, you see a pattern, right? All, all these paradoxes are created through self-reference and trying to make a system talk about itself. Uh, roughly, then, how the question did, um, sorry, how did Churchy the Lambda Calculus? Because I only remember the Lambda Calculus, like in its inception, being it was about Hilbert, uh, but I don't recall him having. Uh, doing something analogous to that. How did how did Church do that with the lambda calculus? So hope, hopefully we'll see. I'll try try and get his original paper out. Okay. So for for Turing it was called the halting problem. So there's there's yeah. a equivalent of the halting problem which Church expresses using the lambda calculus. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Let's let let's try and get Church's actual paper out in a few weeks yeah and we'll we'll yeah. get Turing's original paper out as well and we'll compare them and we'll see we'll see exactly what they they both said 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's Do it's that. easier to it's easier to understand in Turing's version because it is this very nice you know, physical analogy of a bit of paper tape. It's very easy to visualize. So lambda calculus is going to work more like a, a Lisp machine. Um, it's at a higher level of abstraction, not as high as Godel's level of abstraction, but sitting somewhere between the two. So rough, roughly, then these these problems they all have have the same form. You're you're going to claim that you've built a machine that can answer any mathematical problem, and I'm going to create a new problem that you can't answer. And that problem is going to have this kind of form. I'm I'm going to say, what will you do tomorrow at nine o'clock? Um, and if you're going to make a cup of tea, then don't. And if you're not going to make a cup of tea, then do. And that's the the program um, I'm going to give you. And so you you can't answer the question of what you're going to do tomorrow because part of the decision making process of what you're going to do is built into the the question itself to to create a logical contradiction. So again, this is just an English language overview. You have to look at the actual mathematics of it to to really see what what's going on here. Um, and again, if if any of you want to read the rest of Godelasha Bach. There, there are many analogies to this all through the book. You know, one one is this idea of a, a record player. Um, so you're you're going to claim you've created the most perfect record player in the world, or the perfect record player. There can't be a most perfect, right? There can only be perfect or not perfect. Um, and when when you come and propose that to me, I'm going to design a record. I'm going to create a vinyl record, and the audio track I put on it is designed to resonate all the frequencies of your record player that will make it shake around and destroy itself. You know, any any mechanical device has has a resonant frequency or a set of resonant frequencies. Um, and I'm going to create this record that destroys your record player. So you could go away and create a different record player that can play my record, but then I'm going to design a new record that blows that one up as well. And we, we can just Keep on going forever. <coughs> and this, this of course, like is the only thing. Sorry? Sorry? That sounds like a very weird type of arms race. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. You know, so if, that, if that was how they solved the Cold War, the world would be a lot safer. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really interested in this in my, my research at the moment. Okay, I, I, I work on very small arms races between self driving cars and pedestrians. Um, and I'm, I'm, I, I don't have a proof of it yet. <laughs> I really wish I was as clever as any of these people, or even a, a million as clever as these people, to actually be able to prove it. I, I have a hunch that this thing is actually existing every time someone crosses the road. I think there is a little uncomputable problem um, every time a pedestrian and a car try to predict each other's behaviour, because one of them has to get out of the way to avoid a, avoid a crash and take a place. So yeah, we've gone through a bunch of models in game theory, and the, you know, the game theorists, they came from the Cold War as well, right? It's the, the same mathematics. But yeah, when when you have a two-player game like that, you know, you're each trying to predict the other player's behavior, but they're trying to predict your behavior. So you are effectively having to predict your own behavior as a result of that. It's just gone around two players rather than one. So I, I have this ongoing hunch that somehow we should be able to reduce that to to one of these halting machine type problems and show that there actually is no no solution. There's there's no solution to the Cold War and there's no solution to, to crossing the road. But that's that's only a hunch. You know, if I if I if I ever manage to prove it and get a Nobel Prize or whatever, I'll I'll let you know. But otherwise it's just a, a wild guess in the pub until then. <coughs> uh, okay. So this was 1936. We had a bunch of models of computation proposed for the purpose of defining what is an algorithm and for the purpose of answering that second problem um, from Hilbert's problems. And we got a negative answer to it. 
Um, which again is kind kind of a miserable place to be in, right? Two the, the two big Hilbert problems related to our subject, and they both come back with negative answers now. So we're really floating around now. We really we no longer have a foundations for mathematics or really for anything anymore. Um, and we know that there is no algorithm that is able to answer questions. You know, so some some people see this as a very positive thing even now. Yeah. So there's a set of theorems in computer science called the full employment theorems. And the, you know, the famous one is the full employment theorem for compiler writers. It shows that creating the perfect compiler is one of these problems. And so some people see this as a very positive thing because it means their, their job as a compiler writer will never, in principle, be replaced by a, an AI system because there's always something else to do. And you know, some people will endow humans with a kind of magical aura suggesting that they can do things that machines can't. Um, again, there's nothing in the mathematics that talks about humans or, or biology. There's a certain level of analogy making and speculation as soon as you come out of the, the formal logic. Um, but in, in general, these ideas do, do seem to work out. These do tend to be areas which humans are still employed to work in. If you even get a, a little sniff of uncomputability around an area, that's probably going to be quite a, a secure career for a, a human computer scientist um, to go and work in. <coughs> so that's that's really the end of. I shouldn't have called this modern logic. I should call this contemporary logic, actually. Because that, that really is the end of the, the modernist project. Yeah, we're, we're now in this new period where no one is sure of what the foundations are. We can still go on doing all these things. We can still go on doing logic and computation. But we are generally happier now to accept that there could be different sets of axioms. There could be multiple logics that are all found empirically to be useful for doing different things. And if the logic is useful, then we'll, we'll jump on it and write a computer program that implements it and make some money by selling it to a client, ultimately. But there, there isn't one true logic anymore. There, there are logics, not logic now. Um, so you know, how has this come down to what we do now in our contemporary rather than modern times? Okay. So, you know, an, an offshoot of Russell's work in mathematics was what we now call logical atomism. So this was Russell and his PhD student, Wittgenstein, who worked together to create a logical foundation, not of maths, but of stuff, a logical foundation for objects and talk, talking about objects and their, their properties. So you know, remember we discussed Aristotle last week, and we were trying to define, you know, what exactly is a man, what exactly is mortality, and so on. And you know, as in Aristotelian logic, you need to ultimately come down to what what is a what is the basic thing called a thing. <laughs> there are there seem to be two different kinds of things, at least. There are objects like Socrates, and then there are properties like being mortal, and somehow the mortalness lives inside Socrates, or Socrates is a collection of all these properties um, which together make up Socrates. Um, and so, you know, this, this shows up in Russell and Wittgenstein's work as claims like this. There's a, a famous claim in Wittgenstein's book that the world is made of facts, not of things. So Russell and Wittgenstein are proposing roughly what you have seen as prologue. Okay, roughly a world that looks like this, a world where there are objects like James and John and balls and the park, and there are properties and relations um, which are predicated of them. So the word, the word predicate just means said. Um, I think it comes from Greek, it comes from Aristotle. Yeah, when, when we predicate something, it, it simply means we say it. You know, we can say that James is the parent of John. We can say that James is a human. And so on. Um, but this lo logical atomism philosophy was you know, developed before practical computers. It was developed just with pen and paper. 
and it was an attempt to try and explain the structure of the world by reducing it to formal logic, uh, which could then be manipulated um, according to axioms and rules. Yeah, and that's that's what we now know as AI or real AI or old-fashioned AI, depending on your point of view. Um, it also became the foundation for things like relational databases and for you know, the SQL language that you've probably come across. And so the relational view of the world is different from the object-oriented view of the world. Okay, in a relational database, there are tables of relations. There are entities which only exist as names, and a, a relation connects these named entities together. You know, so if we say there is a parent relation between James and John, right? James is the parent of John. The parentness in this relation exists outside of the substances. Okay, let's say James and John are substance. That's an Aristotelian word. Um, but the parentness isn't inside James and it isn't inside John. The parentness is a relation that floats around connecting them, but is independent of them. Um, and, you know, even today, we have this very famous problem called the object relational mismatch. And I used to get paid some nice money for trying to sort this out in other people's code in finance. Um, you know, half the team go off and build stuff in relational databases and the other half want it to be object oriented. And someone like me gets paid to sort out the mess when they interact. <laughs> You're trying to pull stuff out of the relational database and turn it into objects or turn it back from objects into relation. And this, this comes from two fundamentally different views of how we should talk about objects in the world. Now, this idea of objects with properties and classes comes from Aristotle, but the idea of relations in AI and in Prolog and databases and SQL comes from Russell and Wittgenstein, and they're not compatible with each other. They're different ways of using logic to talk about the world. So, you know, we see this show up now. It's the reason why the semantic web isn't really working. It's the reason why AI still isn't working. Um, and it's becoming a bigger and bigger issue, especially in data science now, as we go to big data, um, which is the stated financial motivation for this module, I think. Um, big data is all about combining different people's data sets together and making them talk to each other. And if one of you has gone off and set up all your data using one, what is called ontology, one way of modeling objects and properties, and another of you goes off and uses a different way, then your data is just incompatible. And so there are attempts such as BFO, this is called the basic formal ontology which basically tries to standardize these ideas from Aristotle and Russell and Wittgenstein and make them coherent so that everyone can talk to everyone else and actually share meaningful representative um, data. Between those <coughs> so you know, this, this is the path that took us from logic to AI and, and data science. Okay, this, this, is, this branched off independently of what the mathematicians were doing. Um, and you, know, you, you can see it's a nice sort of retirement project for Russell in particular, after he'd just finished his giant three volume proof that one plus one equals two with Whitehead. It must have been pretty nice just to drink coffee with Wittgenstein and talk about the whether the redness of apples is inside the apples or is external to them and so on. And, and then, then he could avoid getting drawn into the Jodel controversy and yeah, have have a nice time thinking about ontology and, and objects instead of math. <coughs> um, you know, other ways in which what we now call logic have developed is by extending their representative power to be able to talk about other things. So we saw Aristotle's logic was all about um, ev everything and something. You know, all men are mortal. Some men are Socrates and so on. Um, you know, Boole's logic was about truth, truth and falsity and the mathematization. And then Frege brought back the Aristotelian ideas and combined them with what Boole was doing. 
but um, you know, more, more recently you have, for example, what is called modal logics. So this is by Saul Kripke in 1959. Um, I think Kripke's still alive. I saw, I saw him speak once in Edinburgh. Um, so Kripke is interested in what are called possible worlds or possible world semantics. When we talk about all men are mortal, we normally mean the men that are actually here, you know, in this room or in this world. Um, Kripke is interested in all the different configurations that the world could be in, you know, either all the ways that it could be now but isn't, um, or equivalently all the ways that it could be in the future. So, you know, Freakian logic is able to model English words like all and some, but Kripke's modal logic can model will uh, can model words like uh, necessary and possibly. So we've got these new symbols, the boxes and the diamonds. Okay, one way to interpret this, and, and remember, this whole subject is about the symbols connecting to a meaning. Okay. Um, so one way to give meaning to the boxes and the diamonds is through necessary and possibility, where you read the square as um, necessary. The square phi means it is necessary that phi is true. Okay. So what 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 could phi be? I don't know. All coffee is brown. Okay. So you could say it is necessary that coffee is brown. Um, actually, this is negated. So this statement says it is not it is not necessary that coffee is brown. Okay, and the right hand side is possibly. This means possibly coffee is not brown, and the equality means that you can convert each side into the other side. They're both equivalent statements. So you could turn this into a pair of sequence where you can go either from this one to that one or vice versa. So, you know, have a little think about it. If it is not necessary that coffee is brown, is that equivalent to possibly coffee isn't brown? Okay. Um, uh, it works one way, but not the other. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to leave this with you as a, an exercise, I think. Um, to look at this and and the other theorem. Now, why, why why do you think it doesn't work the other way? Oh wait, oh wait, no, uh, because I misread it. Because the knot is on one side of the the box. That's that's clever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, that, that does work both ways. In in all my slides, it is perfectly possible there are bugs, and I think this actually adds to the fun because it can make you think harder. If if you think you found a bug, you might actually have. Or you, or, or, or you might not. So it is going to make people think. Yeah. Um, so look, the, the other interesting thing about these symbols is they can take multiple interpretations. But this possible and necessary is um, one way of reading them. But other authors have proposed different ways of reading the symbols. So you can also try and interpret square as meaning we must do something, and diamond as we may do something. And especially if you ever work with engineers, you will have tons of fun with these words. You know, en engineers put words like shall and may into all their contracts. So when you when you tell them to go and build your robot and you write the contract and they say, you know, the robot may actually work and they come back and there's nothing there and they're like, ah, we only said it may work. You, you, you should have said the robot shall work by June. <laughs> This is the voice of experience working with engineers. Um, but look, you can try and read that same theorem using this different interpretation. Okay, if it's not the case that we must make the robot work, um, then we may not make the robot work. Okay, we're, we're allowed to not make the lo the robot work if it isn't the case that we actually have to do it. So you know, with with Kripke's logics, we can now talk about all these extra things. So in, in particular, you remember when we did Boolean logic back in the day, we had some problems with that little arrow symbol that many people tried to read as if and then. 
and if and then is very hard to define. What, what you really mean when you talk about if and then is that in every possible world where X has happened, Y also happens, okay? So if X then Y means if I do X, then Y actually takes place in every possible world. And that's not the same thing as the little truth table that Boole proposed, because Boole can only talk about one world, usually the world that we're actually in. So it was o only in 1959 we actually got the logical power to really understand if properly and to, to be able to model it um, with these logics. Yeah, I've always found that there's been a lot of ambiguity around if as to whether it's causation or correlation. Uh, it's always bugged me. Yeah. So with, with Kripke logic, you can really nail that down. And now we can talk about causation. So actually, this is the reason why most of classical statistics is bullshit. Right? Um, there, there are ways of doing statistics properly. And you know, the, the, the Bayesians have really jumped on this. The, the Bayesians have really taken Kripke's theory. And if you've come across the books by uh, Yuda Pernal, he wrote the big book on Bayesian networks, and then he did a book called Causality. And causality is a marriage of Kripke's theory of causation with Bayesian theory of statistics. And it shows you how you can really do statistics properly so that you can, in fact, talk about causation. Yeah. Um, That's really good, the marrying of probabilistic reasoning and causation. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, in, in particular, you know, so somewhat off topic, but interesting anyway, and relevant with COVID, um, you can understand now that something like a clinical trial, okay? You, have you seen the, the challenge trials they're doing now? They're actually going to inject a bunch of people with COVID, or they're going to put it up their nose or something. Yeah? So, you know, why is it necessary to do that? all the trials we've done so far have been passive we sit back and we just observe whether a bunch of people get covid or not and whether they recover from it or not and whether they have the vaccine and we look for correlations right when you do a challenge trial you're using this theory you are putting causation into the system right you are as a scientist you are personally going in and you are causing a bunch of people to get covid and because you have put causation into the system, you are therefore entitled to read causal inferences out of the system. OK, so this is why scientists do experiments. They go in and they actively cause something and then they observe the results. And when they do that, they can make much stronger inferences than people who just sit there passively looking for correlations. Yeah? If, you, if you actually go and put COVID at people's noses, you can do a much better job of saying the vaccine causes you to get better than if you just sit around and passively watching it. And you know, this this is a big problem with the data science movement because data science is trying to do the opposite of that. They're trying to stop doing science altogether and just observe data that already exists, but without doing any causal experimentation. So you know for for, for all the people you meet in the pub who say philosophy and logic have made no progress in all these hundreds of years, you know, here's something that happened in 1959 that is just utterly relevant to a whole bunch of things. This was a ma major advance, both in philosophy and in, in logic, if, if there's even a difference. Um, between that the statement in the pub sounds like a facade to cover a lack of understanding to me, but I'm a skeptic. Yeah, yeah, you know, try. <laughs> we could try reading Kripke. Um, it's quite, quite scary. Um, if it's interesting for you guys, you know, we have some flexibility in what what we read every week. We could, we could certainly attempt it um, as we go along. I mean, this this has also become applied directly in computing, in hardware and software verification, because when you build your Intel floating point unit, and you don't want a two billion dollar bug where it can't add properly. Um, you, know, you would, <laughs> you'd really like to say that in all possible worlds, my CPU actually works. Okay, and this this gives us the language that we're going to find in those 
software systems for, for actually verifying that. You, know, you don't just want the system to work in one particular world, you know, also known as a unit test, but you want it to work in every possible world where, where anything could happen to the system. Um, I, I'm going to put another vote in for that. That sounds wonderful. Okay. Wonderful is not the word I'd choose, but I definitely want to fall into it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just let that one absorb me and spit me back out, and we'll see what happens. Good. So other interesting things. Um, Paraconsistent logics. I think I've alluded to this a number of times. So these are logics in which things don't just have to be true and false. They they might be both. They might be both true and false, or they might be neither. They might be neither true nor false. And you know, this this is a absolutely post Godelian view of the world that you can create these alternative logics. And if you if you find they happen to be useful for something, then it's absolutely your right to, to go and use them and to be useful for you. Um, you know, ultimately, to, to make money through your computer science work. So, you know, for, for example, these logics are used by the people who design your mobile phone um, digital logics because they give you a nice way to talk about states of electronic devices that aren't just representing Boolean truth or falsity, right? We, you know, at a basic level, we represent false by zero volts and truth by five. Or take a pick, some of the number of volts. Um, and these systems can, in some cases, get into other physical states. They can get into states where they're in the middle of those voltages. They can get into states where they're just not connected to anything. It's, you know, if you cut the wire. <laughs> the, the, the wire is meant to be containing a voltage, and if you just cut a wire so nothing's connected to anything else, um, you get what's called a high, high impedance state, um, you know, which is in most cases a, an error state, but you have to keep track of how that error is going to propagate around the rest of the digital logic. Um, and this notion of both in digital electronics, it shows up as what we call don't care. You can make your calculations much easier if you keep track of which states you just don't care about. So you might have a hundred variables and you care about the state of A, B, and C, and you just don't care whether M is true or false or whether S is true or false. And so you can put those variables into this fourth state called don't care, which is compatible with paraconsistent logic being both true and false at the same time. And you can make rules of inference about how how you're not caring flows through the system. So look, for, for example, right, here's here's and, yeah? So, you know, this this is Boolean logic. Um, sits as a, um, so the Boolean logic will be here. So false, false and true, this is Boolean logic, okay? So true and true is true, but anything else is false. Now, if you, if you take a wire in digital electronics and you end it with a wire that you don't care about, yeah. Have a think about it. What, what What's the result of that? What's true and don't care? So I think I think you're going to have to not care about the result of that. Okay. The, the the don't care wire is effectively both. It's true and false at the same time. So when when you do logical and, if the other input is true, the output is going to be the the same as the the input that isn't true. Yeah, you've got you've got one true input and a a a description of what anding is is that if if the first input is true, the second input takes a copy. Um, so the, the output takes a copy of the second input. If the second input was both true and false or don't care, then the the output becomes don't care or both true and false. Okay, if you if you do it and um, Okay, let's look at the other example. Let's say if you do, and again, there, there could be bugs in these tables, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to verify them as um, past this week. Let's take an or example, right? If you do true or neither, okay? So you have a variable that is neither true or false. 
and you're going to or it with a variable that is true. You can conclusively say that the result of that is true because the way or works is that it only needs one input to be true and then it doesn't matter what the other one is anymore. Um, so yeah, home, homework or workshop task is to go through these tables and convince yourself why this logic actually works in that sense. Or if you can find any bugs in it, please come and let me know. I think I just spotted one. Um, you know, as with all these logics, the symbols have different interpretations. So in digital electronics, we consider neither as representing this high impedance state. It means you cut the wire, physically cut the wire. Um, and B means I don't care what the state is. In AI, they can take different meanings. So TMS was the truth maintenance system. This this is my probably my favorite piece of AI research of all time. Um, and coming from the same year as Goethe Lesher Bach, um, which was not a coincidence. They were both coming out of MIT around that time. And both thinking about these ideas of going beyond classical logic. Um, so in truth, maintenance system neither takes on this state that I don't know. You know, in, in AI, I'm going to tell you a bunch of things. You know, all men are more, all, all apples are red, um, all unicorns are fluffy. But then if I pose a question that you just can't answer, you know, are all vehicles orange? And I, I've just not given you any axioms that help you make a decision one way or another. You know, the, the correct answer to are, are vehicles orange is I don't know. And so this variable takes on a state that is neither true nor false. You just don't know. So this is like the um, the court system in Scotland. In, in England, you're either guilty or you're not guilty. In Scotland, you are guilty or innocent or we don't know. And there are there are three logical values that a, a Scottish court can, can return. Um, yeah, all, also in TMS, you get the, the double state. You can end up both thinking that X is true and not true. And that, that can be represented. And this roughly means that you have a problem. <laughs> and some, some human beings will experience this. Probably most of you, if you really think about it. You know, some, sometimes you will go through a rational argument and you can draw out all those little um, syllogisms. And you, know, you can con convince yourself that um, Joe Biden is great or whatever. And then you're going to go through a different logical inference, you know, also with rules that you think are all solid and holding up, and convince yourself that Joe Biden is not great. And you know, you are now in a state where you possess proofs of both X and not X. And this is a very useful state to be in. You know, there are many, many great discoveries and insights have come through this process of being in that mental state for a while and realizing that you have a problem and therefore being able to go and do something to, to figure it out. And so TMS maintained both of these states. It represented them using a formal, what is called a paraconsistent logic. Um, and you know, not, not only can it make inferences, but it can also begin to understand when something is wrong and when it needs to go out and think more or find new information about the world. I imagine that quantum mechanics can be quite rife with this sort of thing. It just kind of reeks of applications there. Yeah, yeah, there are at least analogies to be made between these logics and QM. So quantum logic is a very recent development in, in logic as well that is accurately representing the, the states that quantum systems can get into, which yeah. looks somewhat like a power consistent object. Good. I don't think we're going to get to lambda calculus this week, but um, let's just talk about applications and have a rest. I'll, I'll leave you with some of this as talk. We'll, we'll do lambda calculus next week. Um, okay, look, where, where are we now as computer scientists with all of this? You know, how how is that history ended up in things that people are doing today? So, you know, the the Wittgenstein and Russell view of logical atomism um, was actually proved to be very wrong in philosophy quite some time ago, but is still in AI, interestingly. Um, 
so you, know, you will find systems like Prolog and SQL that are explicitly based on this type of representation. Right here are a bunch of substances, tables, hands, boxes on tables. You're representing logical relations like something being on something else. And you know, Prolog is one particular way of applying a set of rules to these logics to try and prove theorems about them. Um, it is certainly not the only way. And I think the way AI is often taught is quite deceptive here because the prolog gives you this magic box where you ask it a question and it tries to tell you yes or, or no. Um, and you don't really see how the inference is actually getting done under the hood. Yeah, or you, you have to study um, how the inside the prologues work. But you know, in, internally, it's doing its own search procedures and unification and so on. And there, there are many different ways that you could structure those computations. And you know, pro probably this is the reason why Prolog has never really caught on, is that it fixes a particular search procedure in place. And that's the one you're stuck with, right? So it's like if we were to go to Matthew's MIU system, and ask it whether or not something is a theorem. It has a particular breadth first way of searching through all the theorems and seeing what comes out. And you know, in some cases, you might have other information or other ideas about how it would be better to structure your, your inferences. Um, so in my PhD thesis, I, I looked at this for a while. Are there, are there other ways we can stick these logical rules together in different orders and guide the search in different directions? Um, to go beyond what Prolog is doing. Um, but yeah, rough, roughly this idea of logic programming, logical representation um, is still with us in, in that flavor of, many, many people call it good old fashioned AI to distinguish it from machine learning. Um, I prefer to call it real AI, but it's never really caught on. Like, like the real IRA, yeah, but with AI. Ooh. Sorry, did I just violate a university rule by mentioning a terrorist organization? So Probably. I'll edit that out from the recorder. Um, <laughs> OK, um, where else does logic show up in modern computer science? Um, you know, a major interest is in verification, both of hardware and of software. So when we studied software engineering last year, we talked a lot about the limitations of testing, okay, a, a unit test can only consider a finite sample of all the possible worlds that your system could end up in. Um, you know, and you kind of hope that if your system passes the test, then it will work in all the other possible worlds as well. Um, but there's a lot of hope involved in that. You know, wouldn't it be nice if we could actually take your program or your hardware design and actually prove that it does what it's supposed to do? Yeah, so in, in the way that we proved that MU is not a theorem of the MIU system, can we prove that your program for computing factorials actually computes the factorial in every possible case? Yeah, a factorial function has an infinite number of possible inputs, so you can't run tests on all of them. But you can prove that it works, okay? So here's, here's a factorial function. And this is written with what, what I called contracts um, last year. So a contract says I'm going to assume something about the, the state of the world before my program runs, and I'm going to promise something about the state of the world after my program runs. So in this case, here's my factorial function. Okay. Um, so we're going to be computing x factorial, um, assuming that x already has a value. And we're going to promise that at the end of this, y is equal to x factorial. And we're not assuming anything. So t just means true. We're assuming that we're just not in an inconsistent state. So what you see here is a set of syllogisms, or in this context, we call them sequence. They're the same thing. And you can see each application has a name. You see the little w, i, c? So you know, as as we saw with the rules for the MIU system, um, you know, there's a set of axioms, a set of rules, 
And here we have constructed a proof of why this function actually works. Okay, so you're saying this is all going to work if this thing works and this thing works up here. And we've, we've split it into two pieces. Um, so I'm not going to go through this now. You know, we'll have a whole lecture on this kind of thing. But roughly, you've got a proof that is made from a bunch of syllogisms. And each syllogism has a, a, a input contract and an output contract and a, a little bit of program. And we're going to break down that big program into little pieces of programs until we end up with axioms. And then we prove that the thing actually works. <coughs> That's uh, what um, template metaprogramming looks like. I've, I've just realized what this has reminded me of, is that that's how you lay out template metaprogramming, where mm -hmm. you, a lot of people um, say that it corresponds to something like functional programming. It's more, it's more like this, where you're giving like a concrete proof of the program, but it's also what the program is doing at the same time, mm -hmm. which is how the, the compiler is able to. So I don't have a, I guess, application, but yeah, I, I only just cut Good, good. So, so again, you know, if, if people are interested in links like this, yeah, we, we do have some flexibility in this module. If, if you want to pull out something for everyone to read on template network programming, um, I don't, I don't think anyone should read anything about template metaprogramming ever, especially not programs written with template metaprogramming. <laughs> okay, so that you, you can do the same thing with hardware, and you know this this is where it's really become commercialized. And you know, there are people at ARM, for example, who get paid very nice wages indeed for for doing this to prove that ARM CPUs actually work and so that you're not going to get into a situation like the Intel Pentium where the arithmetic unit didn't actually do maths correctly. <laughs> really disastrous newspaper headlines that Intel CPU cannot add. <laughs> really what you don't want if you're a CPU something. Um, so look, here's, here's a piece of digital electronics. This should be familiar from our architecture studies. Um, this I think is an adder. It's got a power and a ground, but here's carry out. Um, here's P1 and P2 coming in. Here's the sum out. Here's the, the carry out. Okay. Um, actually, this is a half adder. No, it, it's a full adder. It's got carry in sitting over here. Okay. This is a full adder, which you should recognize then from um, our first year. But you know, now we want to take this to the next level. We want to take this design as something we've been given. Um, and we want to prove that it actually functions as an adder and that it can never do anything else as long as the individual components do what they're supposed to do. Um, so what you've got here is a big logical description of this circuit. This, this description is equivalent to the diagram. You could, for example, reconstruct the diagram from this description, or you could have a computer program that takes this as an input and creates the diagram from it. So roughly each term here is a representing a component. And the component is a relation between some inputs and some outputs. Um, and they're all getting anded together. And then you say, does there exist the state of all the the wires connecting them together? Because you, you don't know in advance which wires are high and low. So you let those be free by saying, can can you find the coherent state of all those? But if you're able to vary the states of the wire, does the whole thing actually add up to being a, an adder? You know, does this logical expression add to to giving the table of inputs and outputs that you think defines an adder? So again, we, we could have a whole lecture on this. We'll try and do that if we have time, because this is really employable stuff now. You know, if you going to build a circuit to go on a Mars rover, it absolutely has to work. And this stuff is expensive to do and time consuming, but it's worth doing it in cases like that. <coughs> so you, know, you, you can run the same ideas on maths. So you know, from, from our perspective, math, pure mathematics is just an application of computer science, right? We've seen 
here are all these applications. We can do AI, we can do hardware verification, software verification. Um, yeah, pure maths is just another form of applied computer science, where pure maths has its own set of axioms and rules that mathematicians enjoy playing with and which correspond to things like numbers and shapes and algebraic entities. And yeah, the job of a human mathematician is to prove theorems using those axioms and those rules. And this work is increasingly becoming automated um, in two senses. So in one sense, we're doing verification. So look, no one, no one told us how to design this adder. You know, a human creative engineer proposed this circuit and we're just verifying it. So yeah, we can do that with maths. We can take a proof written by a human mathematician and we can verify it by putting it in this system and checking that each step of the proof actually works. And this is finally becoming quite popular now. There are some mathematics journals that will actually do this and they'll accept your computerized verification along with your research paper to prove that what you've said is actually going to work. Because until that happened, <laughs> you'd get Andrew Wiles's 2000 page proof of Fermat's last theorem and some poor reviewers had to actually read it and decide as humans whether they thought it was good or not. And that's that's how the peer review process works for mathematics. So, you know, this, this is a revolution because we can now computerize that proof checking process through systems like Metamath and Isabel um, are some of the big ones. You know, can, more, more exciting than that is can we actually do the creative part of the mathematics automatically? Uh, yeah, and this is a branch of AI known as automated theory proving. So yeah, we can run these AI systems to find theorems about how to move boxes from one part of the table to another, but we could use similar systems to find ways to get us from one state of a formal system into another, yeah, such as proving that a, a written down mathematical theorem is correct or not. So verification is now very, not hugely widely accepted, but there are cases of it being accepted by actual mathematicians. Automated theorem proving still something of a, a research area. I think it's it's really waiting for a a big proof to come along, a, a, a non-trivial new proof that will show that AI can actually outperform um, human mathematicians. I mean, there's There's been a few cases of computers used to prove theorems more by brute force than intelligence. So things like the four color theorem were proved by computer, showing that you only ever need four colors to color in a map on a 2D surface. But you know, may, maybe one day soon, we're going to see the first proof of something really interesting, you know, the next Fermat's last theorem. Um, and when, when an AI does that before a, a human, then, then we're going to be in a very interesting place indeed. Um, I'm going to stop in a minute. Uh, we'll do Lambda Calculus next week. But um, let's talk a little bit about language design. This is the other place that logic is really going to show up. Um, you will see equations or sequence written like this, both for describing type systems and for describing what is called operational semantics. Um, so you, you probably know what a type system is by now. Uh, a, a really basic type system just says everything is either an int or a string or a cat or a, a dog um, if you're defining your own classes. But when you go to functional programming, you have all these other types, like the type of a function which takes an int to an int or a function which takes an int to a function that takes an int to an int. And keeping track of those kinds of types can get very complex. Um, and for a long time, it was thought to be a human creative problem to keep track of them. And it was a surprise in 1969 or 1978, depending how you count, when Hindley uh, and or Milner um, found a way of using logical inference to sort out those type systems. So the Hindley-Milner type system is what you get in languages like ML. Um, again, ML is the, the perfect language. It's still the perfect language 
even though no one ever uses it. Um, but one of the, the key features ML introduced was the ability to automatically infer the types of everything, which means that the programmer doesn't have to go around typing on a keyboard um, saying what everything is, because ML will just work out the type of all your functions for you. And you know, this has just started to show up in languages like C um, or C++. For example, we saw in Matthew's code, he was using a lot of auto variables. So this kind of inference is exactly what you get every time you declare a variable in modern C++. And that's come from standard ML and from Hindley Milner um, type inference. And you know, rough, roughly, you know, again, we can have a whole lecture on this. I'm not going to go into it. Roughly, these are statements saying some variable has a certain type. And you know, this is the type that goes from sigma to tau to sigma. It's a function that returns a function. Um, going from tail to, to sigma. And you can break down a complex type into a set of smaller types by going through those logical deductions. So op operational semantics is a similar idea, but it's for describing the active behavior of languages. Um, so for example, this is a syllogism or a sequence which defines the meaning of a language expression. So this is a term in your language. L becomes equal to E, okay? A variable becomes equal to the value of an expression. And S is the state of the system, the state of the world. And we're saying that the effect of this expression, L becomes equal to E, um, it's going to evaluate to whatever the state was, but together with a new assignment where this piece of memory storing L has taken value V. And it's going to do that in exactly the case that expression E has a value which evaluates to V. Okay, so you've broken down you've broken down quite a complex expression. This is an assignment of a named variable to the value of an expression. And you've broken it down to the simpler statement that says the expression has to evaluate to V. And you can do some of the things, for example, to define what a while loop is. So you know, a, a big problem in language design is two people go off and try to implement the same language and they can't agree on what the language is supposed to do. Um, so someone needs a way of writing down the definition of what the language does, and that's called operational semantics. So you know, for example, here we're defining what while actually means. So while is defined through two syllogisms or sequence. So this one is in the case where B is true. This is in the case where B is false. So if B is true and you have this, you're going to evaluate C and then you're going to evaluate while B do C. But if B is false, you're not going to do C and the system stays in the same state S. And you know when people get into arguments about um, scoping usually and side effects, you know what, what C++ is actually named after a horrific language feature. You're, you're, you're typing C++ to increment the variable, but it, it's actually misnamed, isn't it? So it should actually be called plus plus C because it has the. Yeah, yeah because actually words. it's just returning C. So C++ is just C, yeah. guys. Yeah, we're that's waiting right. the, for the, the next value iteration. Of C++ is just C, it isn't C plus one. And you know, these these kinds of issues can be nailed down by defining um, sequence in operational semantics. And you know, the, the dream of this, which as far as I know still isn't realized, is that one day you will design your own language by typing out a load of these sequence and you'll give them to a compiler piler, compiler compiler, and it will create the language for you. So you know you do this to some extent with syntax. You can give a BNF description of a grammar and use Flex and Bison to make you a skeleton for your compiler. But you still have to manually go in and write code for what the language actually does after it's done the parsing. So this would be taking compiler compilers to the next step and they take a an input file of operational semantics and they generate the whole language thing. Can we decide to call compiler compilers meta compilers instead? Meta -compilers. I think it's got a, it's got a, it's got a nicer ring to it. Yeah, there's there's a lot of meta in in this course. Yeah, 
this is this is a heavy metal but... <laughs> all right so look, we'll save lambda calculus for next week then like this, this has completed our study at least of the history and modern times of logic and computation this is a summary of where it all sits now so look historically logic sat on top of grammar or what is now called ontology whereas the more days you're more likely to study logic first and then get into ontology as something that sits on top of logic so, you know ontology is these issues of database design and language representation and ai about how do you represent what is in the world what are the objects what are the properties what is an object what is a property um, whereas ai in this context stands for automated inference now, this is using those representations to create proofs to create theorems um, you know, verification is kind of a, a subset of that you know, you'd like a system that can just design the adder for you but if you can't do that then you can at least make a, a verification version now as we talked about in Matthew's program it's a lot easier to verify Gary's proof of a MIU theorem than it is to generate a new proof so you know coming off of ontology then you know modern analytic philosophy analytic philosophy means English and American philosophy roughly Anglo-American philosophy um, is all based on this approach it's all based on what Frege and Russell and Wittgenstein did um, so you know those people will go off and make arguments about how ontology should work and what should represent what the more practically here in data science database design um, you know, structural representations semantic web um, we all have these fields of data ontology data representations which sit on those ideas and you know, those those lead into things like nlp where you have to ask what does an english sentence actually mean you know you, you're going to translate an english sentence into some computer representation but that representation has to exist in terms of an ontology and it has to be manipulatable by the logic um, whereas on the active automated inference side you have general problem solving you know, this is prologue and figuring out how to move piles of boxes on tables um, has never hugely caught on in the way it was supposed to interesting question why and whether it might catch on again in the future works in some applications if the first Gulf War was largely planned by one of these systems um, called dart and it scheduled all the logistics of the equipment for the Americans uh, moving around the Gulf and they reckon the money they saved by using that AI system repaid the entire American government investment in AI research of its its whole history um, in that single operation so, you know, the dream of this was to have a general problem solver that would be how from 2001 but we've ended up with systems like that that are you know, specialized for particular types of planning you know maybe your university timetables are being scheduled by this kind of AI system um, maybe your project supervisions and your um, team software engineering group formation is being scheduled by such a system um, and you know in, in our view of the world pure maths is applied computer science it is one of many applications of this stuff you know proving theorems about numbers is not so different from proving theorems about chairs and tables and boxes and American military military logistics um, when you do it from this way so look, that's the place of logic in the world you know, Wittgenstein said the world was made of facts and it all built up from there um, this has been around for a very long time um, this is John 1 1 from the Christian Bible um, often mistranslated as in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and no one has the faintest idea what this means right um, no, this this word this is logos okay you can you can read Greek a bit if you do maths because you know the names of these letters right that's that's lambda that's l l or logic um, l o g o s logos so lo, logos means logic this is the word that is used by Aristotle when he talks about grammar and logic 
and rhetoric. It's the, the subject of logic. Um, and this is uh, Theon, or Theos, which means God, as in theology. Um, and these little words are very interesting, okay? So this, this thing means uh, kai, kai logos ni pros, prosigma tafne theon, kai the sigma ni logos, okay? And these words, prosigma tafne, they are fairly untranslatable, from, but they're from Aristotle. These, these are words from Aristotle's Greek philosophy. They mean something like um, is an essential property of, or may, maybe is a necessary and sufficient condition of, or maybe is, is a defining property of. So you know, be, being mortal isn't a defining property of Socrates, because he might not be, but some properties are essential. Yeah, so, um, you know, does a cat have to have four legs? If, if you thought a three-legged animal just wasn't a cat, it would be an essential property. So when you see this pro, pro sigma tafne, it's kind of saying logic, logic is a essential and necessary property of God or, or the world. You might translate this as the universe or, or the world. It's saying logic is what compromises the world um, and this this is the other way around right this is god is logic or the world is logic so you know, when when wittgenstein made this great discovery that the world was made of facts in the 20th century it was sitting here all along the world is made of facts but there's the place of logic in the modern world. Um, yeah, these are some of the topics we're going to be studying. Um, whether lambda calculus is so named because it comes for L for logic is extremely debatable. Um, Church never told anyone. He never told anyone why he picked the letter of lambda. But I think ne next week then we will introduce some lambda calculus um, and I want to start getting more practical. Um, we'll try and do some computational exercises and we'll try actually programming in lambda calculus as a functional programming language hope that was fun see you all next time i'm gonna leave Thanks, you with, thank you i'm gonna leave you with yeah. um what was going to be the That's workshop awesome. sessions oh yeah let me just quickly show you so don't do the lambda calculus stuff because i'm going to save that for next week but make sure you go through the rest of these so if you've not finished your new system stuff go do that uh, the others are just check things on my slides. As I said, there are probably going to be a bunch of bugs in places. Um, take that as an opportunity to uh, to really try and understand it. And try and at least take a look at chapter one of the Lambda Calculus book if you haven't already done so. Try the exercises if you like, but we'll talk about it next week. See you then. See you. Thanks, John.